Hello, Earthlings. Welcome, welcome, welcome to a, another time tunnel. Um, as people who have tuned in before will know, we're slowly, weekly, building up an archive of uh, interesting or important uh, events in the history of the animal advocacy movement. So that's what this is all about. Uh, today, we've got a really interesting subject, um, as, uh, well, I, I hope all of them have been so far, really, uh, and will continue to be so, but we we'll, shall see. Um, just want to remind people that, um, you know, I will I will try and take uh, comments as we go, and of course, there'll be no way that you'll be charged for them, so feel free to put them from it, uh, in there. We've got, we've got Andy in the back room monitoring. So if you put your uh, comments in and uh, if they're good enough, they pass the Andy test, you will, you will get them uh, shown <laughs> on the screen. So uh, there you go. So welcome then to another vegan time tunnel, people. So today's uh, subject is um, Henry Salt. Um, got a got a pretty impressive name, Henry Shakespeare Stevens Salt. He was born in 1851 and he died in 1939. And um, in terms of the uh, the group that he formed, which is uh, the subject here, it's the Humanitarian League. So Henry Salt is often credited to be kind of first wave animal rights, um, if you like. There is some suggestion that it was more like what um, might be called uh, new welfareism, but we'll see that uh, transpire as we go along in the sense that he, he didn't shy away from bringing about reform uh, as he went, uh, as, as it were. So, so we'll see about all that. Just want to show before we start, just switch to this. This is the Henry Salt um, archive, which is on the net. It's, um, let me see, um, henrysalt.co.uk. Uh, it's, um, it's a very big archive, as you can see there. It's got stuff about his life, um, things about him as the author. The, his book reviews here are really interesting. Uh, his friends will will come on to his friends a, a little bit in the story. There's quite an impressive thing. Then you've got a tab for the Humanitarian League itself and the blog. So that's a really good uh, resource that you could go to um, as well as uh, this particular um, time tunnel. So if you get back to this, um, Salt was born in India, very much like Spike Milligan, and he lived to 88 uh, years old and um he had a great friendship with quite a lot of pretty important people including george bernard shaw and um shaw in his usual witty uh self said he was the mildest maddened man that ever defied uh society so these are a rundown of his important books it's only a selection you can go to that archive to see all of them but these are the ones that are important in terms of, of us. So a plea for vegetarianism. I mean, obviously, this is before um, veganism. And in fact, um, I'm going to show you some interaction that uh, Watson had uh, with his work a little later. A Flesh or Fruit, an essay on food reform. And then the, the big one in terms of animal rights theory, animal rights considered in relation to social progress. Um, I think there, though, that book is still available online. I believe there is um, there is talk of a second edition, which might have never been published. But that's an interesting one to kind of chase down. The logic of vegetarianism, humanities of diet, and then a, a brilliantly named autobiography, which is called Seventy Years Among Savages," which is quite an interesting way of um, of putting it. In terms of influence, it was pretty widespread. Not least, um, Gandhi was um, inspired to look at uh, vegetarianism because of Salt's work. And he said, Salt's book, Plea for Vegetarianism, 
whetted my appetite for dietetic studies. I went in for all the books available on vegetarianism and read them. So that was from uh, Gandhi's uh, own autobiography. So he was a self-confessed rationalist and socialist, a pacifist and humanitarian. He was influenced by Darwin uh, very much, and in particular in terms of the Darwinian idea of we are different from other animals in de degree rather uh, as in kind. So that was a, um, an important part of uh, Salt's position. Uh, Mark Gold, um, in this book here, Animal Century, said that uh, Salt was a very rare combination. He said he was a formidable intellect, he was a very talented writer, and an inspired um, campaigner, all coming together um, in one person, uh, as it were. And... Um, I always, I always uh, mention as a sociologist quite often that people are a product of their time. And uh, with that in mind, there is a kind of language warning sometimes. For example, in, in the days when Salt was writing, they would talk about lower animals and sometimes uh, beasts, uh, creatures, th th those kind of things. And so uh, as ever with my audience, I kind of think that, you know, we're mature enough to understand that people are a product of their time. And so therefore they wrote in... Um, in a particular way and uh, often in a sexist way uh, talking about uh, man being meaning humanity of course you know that's the the, the big one in, in that sense uh, but latching on to this idea mark gold said that it uh, takes an enormous leap of imagination to comprehend how different the world was at the beginning of the 20th century and i do really think that is is true in fact um, i often make that case when it comes to the middle of the century or, or close, when it comes to the foundation of the vegan social movement, we have to put ourselves in their place, as it were, to understand their, their worldview and often to understand how radical their position was. Gold goes on to say, <clears throat> for example, that cars and electricity, this is for the vast majority, telephones, radios, um, other taken for granted things were beyond understanding, as he puts it at the time. Uh, women were still to fight for their votes, and the rights of children were hardly considered. Um, so this again kind of situates uh, Salt in his historical um, setting. Really, he was um, born amongst the privileged classes in the Victorian age. He was educated at Eton as many of uh, the British MPs are, for example, and then King's College, Cambridge. So we're into the kind of upper echelons of the education uh, system. He excelled academically and was, in fact, then invited to become a master at uh, Eton himself after being a student there. Uh, this is a very young-looking uh, salt as, as a master at Eton, uh, in fact. Um, when he joined uh, Eton as a master, he, became, he becomes a vegetarian, which was probably quite a radical thing to do um, at the time, which is uh, quite an interesting thing. Um, he was also a socialist, and uh, Gold talks about him being a committed socialist. And this rather puts him at uh, odds with both his class situation and his position at work, uh, if if you like. And so uh, he wasn't really to last too long there and, in fact, started to launch a campaign um, against them uh, after he'd left. He left Eton then in 1884 or 1885. There's some dispute about that. And he, with his wife, rented a labourer's cottage in Surrey and they, their plan was to live a very simple life. Uh, a Dr. Ware, which was Eaton's headmaster at the time, said that Salt's resignation was due to, quote, the incendiary combination of socialism and legumes, which I always think is a, a pretty <laughs> fantastic uh, quote. Uh, Deb, it makes you think about what future generations will think about our lifestyles. Um, well. It, it is interesting. I mean, it, it, it's important, isn't it, 
uh, for people to recognize that you know things change generationally and that when you do look back and you know i'm sure people in the future are going to look back in fact as vegans we of, often hope don't we that they're going to look back and think you know how how did they do that how did they consume other animals and think that's okay how did they exploit and oppress other animals um you know so they will look back in horror presumably uh, at what we do now in the way that we look back i mean if you ever go to these um museums with medieval torture equipment you, you tend to think you know uh, how is that even possible and yet it, it was so this is michael um hollyrod's book on george bernard shaw and this incendiary uh, combination of socialism and uh legumes and uh this one is actually one of the things that Salt said when he left uh, Eaton. He wasn't very complimentary. Uh, you know, as I said, his autobiography was um, 70 Years Among Savages. And he, he, call, he called the Eaton setup um, cannibals in cap and gown, almost literal cannibals, as devouring the flesh and blood of animals and indirectly cannibals living by the sweat and toil of the classes that do the hard work of the world and so you can see just from that one quote how he really really didn't fit in uh with where he was a master at, at eton you know so they moved to surrey as i said and they had no servants there which was virtually unheard of at the time for their class uh, of person and then we get into the campaigning part of uh, Salt's life. He forms the Humanitarian League in 1891, and he remains the secretary uh, of the League for its 28 years uh, in existence. And it's, in fact, the First World War that uh, ends the, uh, the existence of the League. The manifesto of the League was truly remarkable. And setting out, and again, that warning about the language of the time, to destroy the time-honoured uh, ideal of a hard and fast line, as he put it, between uh, white man and black man, or we could just say black and white, uh, rich and poor, the educated and uneducated, and to dispel the idea that there is any difference in kind, again, this Darwinian idea, between human and non-human uh, intelligence so again i mean in 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 terms of the of the aspirations of the humanitarian league uh, you can see that it, it was incredibly kind of radical uh, for its time he said that human and animal emancipation were two reforms that were inseparable and then neither can be fully realized alone uh, which is a sentiment that Donald Watson was to repeat later. But Salt was um, famous for saying this quote about it's not this bloodshed or that bloodshed, it's all bloodshed or all uh, wanton or needless bloodshed that must end. In fact, in terms of the one of our um, time tunnels is the 1989 uh, debate, which is the full debate featuring Tom Reagan, of course, which took place at the British Institute. And one of the contributions from the floor was by David Icke, of all people, who was then representing the Green Party. And he quoted um, uh, Salt uh, quite at length. Uh, it's only, he only talks for about four or five minutes, but um, it's really quite powerful. And he used that particular quote. So the idea is then that you've got this issue that our um, emancipation is going to be uh, wrapped up in everyone else's uh, emancipation and as I said this is a sentiment that Donald Watson was to repeat uh, years ago so if you look at this um, page I don't know if I can see if I can make it a little bit bigger for you if you look at the second column uh, near the um, at the top this is where Watson is saying now nearly half a century later in our, uh, with our increased knowledge and experience we can see what pressing human problems are related to problems of other animals, he's saying, that they will be solved together or not at all. 
and that veganism will be central to their solution. So this is Watson picking up on Salt's position, uh, which essentially is what David Nybert expressed in this idea of entanglements of oppression and liberation. So again, if if you if you are one of the new breed of uh, animals only vegans, do consider that you're rather out of step with the history of the movement, because it's the idea that we can't we can't liberate one without liberating all. Really, we can't leave anyone else behind. Otherwise, it's just not going to work. And this has been expressed time and time and time again in our movement, uh, as it was by Salt, as it was by Watson uh, here. Now, the other interesting part of this is this is um, a little bit earlier in this same um, little snippet, which actually is from 1989, when Donald Watson was doing his presidential kind of log, it was called at the time. Uh, but he was quite critical of Henry Salt. And so this is quite interesting from us as vegans in the sense that um, Henry Salt, from even the titles of his books, was very kind of focused on vegetarianism. And he actually was quite critical of the moves towards non-dairy non vegetarianism and also what would become uh, veganism. And in fact, he even call, called them cock and bull arguments of those opposed to the use of milk and, and eggs. And Watson said, it was uh, but a repeat of what Edward Maitland had written in 1875, that farmyard operations, such as castration, uh, were justified because they allowed the other animals to live a useful life. This view was greeted with silence by the vegetarian movement, a silence that was that prevailed until we broke it in 1944, not before time. So this is quite an interesting little historical uh, comment from Watson in relation to Henry Salt. So it would appear that Salt was a radical reformer and yet would have been opposed to veganism, which was quite interesting uh, in itself. And of course, the reference to 44 is the reference to the birth and the foundation of the uh, the social movement, which came to be called veganism. So according to Salt then, uh, sorry, according to Gold, Salt really was an abolitionist, but he was one of those abolitionists who nevertheless saw the wisdom of pragmatism. So we've got, you know, elements of that in the modern day uh, movement, the kind of pragmatic um, suggestion that we could maybe get involved with a whole series of welfare reforms and that would then lead to abolition there's lots of problems uh, with that stance as many in the in the um in the in the chat will will know but apparently salt was uh one of those for example in the logic of vegetarianism he said that we are content to get rid of the worst evils first so we've got this incrementalism uh, idea Salt argued that it, nece uh, it is necessary to push steadily towards the ideal situation with a faithful adherence to the right line of reform. At, at, least, at least that would imply that um, is that you, as it were, are honest about your end game. You tell people what you want, but then you say, well, you might be able to get a, ser a series of steps to get there. So we're, we're in familiar territory in vegan education here in the sense that, you know, do you hide the fact that veganism is what we want, as some vegan strategists would would um, recommend? Or do we say, well, yeah, the end, the end goal is veganism, but there might be steps towards there. And in that sense, you can take the steps that you feel comf comfortable with, but we're going to explain that veganism is the the end goal. But um, it would seem that salt was a little bit more in the step by step kind of baby steps kind of suggestion, uh, position and actually said that it would be um, that foolishly grasping for the ideal was like a child crying for the moon, which is an interesting kind of anti abolitionist thing to say. And so I think at 
um, given that, that someone like Gary Francion would suggest that this is a, a very early form of, of what he would come to call uh, new welfareism. But other people saw that SALT was very, very radical. Uh, this is sociologist Keith Tester. And he says that SALT was responsible for an epistemological break, which just really means rupture, with his publication, Animal Rights. In essence, SALT brought a new way of looking at human, non-human relations. And in that sense, you could accept that SALT was extremely um, radical. He saw other animals as individuals, a, a radical thing in itself, and said that all individuals should ungrudgingly respect the individuality of others, that no human is justified in thinking of other animals as automatons to be worked or to be eaten. So again, in that sense, uh, a very, very kind of radical uh, position. Tessa suggests that Salt's position, um, that from Salt's position, nearly um, every existing human treatment of other animals uh, was, or still is, uh, bad. Although it's interesting that um, Salt did seem to um, favor um, the keeping of uh, pets, and that would have been the word used uh, to talk about them at the time. It's when Salt talks about how domestic animals should be treated with courtesy and fairness is when we maybe can begin to wonder about whether Salt's animal rights is actually really the idea of the right to welfare or whether it's really animal rights. So there's that question mark, if you like, hanging over um, Salt uh, in that sense. But as I said, I'm not trying to take away from the radicalism of the time. You know, that, that's the last thing I want to do. And in terms of the League's programme, the Humanitarian League's programme of reforms, it was pretty uh, remarkable. For example, this is almost like their rundown of what they were campaigning about. So they campaigned against hunting, the inhumane treatment of human prisoners, uh, vivisection, uh, the use of other animals in fashion. We'll come on to that the treatment of the mentally ill, um, farmed other animals, corporate punishment, slaughterhouse reforms, which is one thing that you could think is, is that abolitionist, is that welfare, that kind of thing, and warfare, as opposed to, to welfare. Described as a systematic protest against the numerous barbarisms of the age. And again, in that sense, very radical. The cruelties inflicted by men on men, and the still more atrocious ill treatment of the lower animals, as it, as it was put uh, in those days. That's an interesting one in the sense that um, wasn't um, frightened, if you like, to put things into perspective, that um, what humans do to other humans is absolutely appalling, uh, but an even bigger problem is the what's called the atrocious ill treatment of other animals. He called for humans to adopt a consistent position towards the right of men and of lower animals alike. Again, this language issue, as I keep saying. And to cultivate a broad system of universal justice for all uh, living beings, which is uh, pretty good. So uh, that there on the right there is the manifesto of the Humanitarian League. And I've just um, um, kind of expanded the top of it, really, which is quite interesting. The Humanitarian League has been established in the belief that the promulgation of a high and positive system of morality in the conduct of life and all its aspects is one of the greatest needs of the time. It will assert as the basis of that system, an intelligible and consistent principle of humaneness, viz. that it is iniquitous to inflict suffering directly or indirectly on any sentient being, except when self-defense or absolute necessity can be justly pleaded. 
then there's a quote from Wordsworth. Um, going back to uh, modern day uh, vegan times, I think that um, that sentiment is actually the same sentiment that's in the modern day definition of veganism. Uh, in other words, the practicable and possible part that it's kind of when absolutely necessary, like in self-defense or, you know, when it's a necessity, which is absolute. Whereas, as we know, in recent times, the the kind of um, the, ve the vegan ideal and the use of those kind of words within the, uh, the modern day definition have been kind of been kind of used to uh, some degree of um, what you could say slippage or sloppiness, if you like. So in their first year, the Humanitarian League launched a campaign against the Royal Buckhounds, which was a deer hunt, but it took them 10 years to close them down. And there is some suggestion that it took a letter written to Queen Victoria uh, for that to come about. And of course, Queen Victoria is the reason why the RSPCA is has got the the royal part of it. It was just the Society of the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals at first, until uh, Queen Victoria took um, took an interest. They also took on the Eton School Beagle Pack. So, in other words, Salt's old school, and that campaign had the support of Christabel Pankhurst, a militant suffragette, as uh, she was called. Uh, Joanna, I guess if Salt lived in this time. He would say companion animals instead of pets. Yes, or he might say animal companions, which is even better than companion animals. The phrase companion animals seem to give them a job, whereas animal companions doesn't. So there's been that progression. It was about the 1980s when companion animal came in. And maybe in the last few years, animal companions has superseded that as well. So they launched this campaign against the, um, the Beagle Pack in Eton. And Pankhurst was involved, this militant uh, suffragette. And it was during that campaign that the word blood sports was coined. So that's quite interesting because um, Salt had a lot to do with the uh, foundation of the League Against Cruel Sports. But the campaign failed. The campaign against the Spiegel Pack uh, failed. Uh, their London Zoo campaign came off a little better, uh, although this is very reformist. Um, because pythons and other large serpents were being fed live ducks and rabbits and even goats, um, all in front of visitors. Now, the, we can say a few things about that, because if it's going on uh, and it's in front of the paying visitors of a zoo, do we have a campaign to hide it or to stop it or what? I mean, if you're going to have pythons and other large serpents in captivity you've got a problem to um to feed them essentially in 1907 the zoo stopped this practice and to this day uh, freshly killed other animals are fed to the reptiles instead so again <clears throat> to what extent that's a, a major victory we could debate in the sense that we still have this this problem of providing uh, food for obligate uh, carnivores. Gold claims that this was a perfect example of salt being pragmatic in order to make things less barbaric um, in that sense. Another campaign uh, was against the murderous millinery uh, business, which is the use of uh, bird feathers in hats. Now, but just going back to the zoo I issue, making things less barbaric. So I presume we'd have to discover how the other animals are freshly killed compared with what happened to them when live rabbits, for example, were put in with these huge uh, serpents and, um, and um, pythons. You know, is that, is that going to be worse and more barbaric than humans killing them? It's a debating point, obviously. So... Another campaign then was this use of birds um, in, um, in fashion and in particular used uh, in hats. In fact, I don't know whether you can see the insert. I'll see if I can make it a little bit bigger. The insert has actually got a crow's head as well as the feathers um, embedded into that. 
into that um, piece of uh, fashion work, if you like. So this is the 21st century uh, when this trade began and millions of birds were massacred for this particular um, uh, trade. The, the, the main picture is the Easter parade of 1911. In Britain in 1894, for example, Britain imported about 25 million slaughtered birds just to be put on hats. Uh, albatrosses, uh, which is, seems a bit, a bit odd, but albatrosses were very uh, popular, but also um, egrets, which are herons, hummingbirds, parrots, and canaries were all among the victims of this particular trade. The rich favored exotic species of birds. The poor often resorted to sparrows and kingfishers. This campaign was responsible for the birth of the RSPCA, the Royal Society of the Perfection, uh, the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, protection of uh, birds, and was supported by the RSPCA, Punch, the satirical magazine, and uh, the Times. In fact, I was trying to find out um, whether this picture was from Punch. It looks a bit punchy, but I'm not quite sure where, where it is. Um, but that was part of their campaign. A bill was drafted to ban taking feathers from certain species of birds. So we're into the difficulty of banning things through a speciesist um, politics. This failed to get through Parliament. So instead, an act to regulate what was called then the plumage trade came in instead. So we went from trying to ban to try to regulate. But it took another 21 years to, the, to get the regulation uh, in place. The League also tried an anti-fur campaign with Salt coming up with the witty line, one man, one skin. But uh, that campaign failed uh, too. And um, Mark Gold points out, of course, that fur was very, very fashionable at that particular uh, time of history, um, more so than now, I would think. But in terms of their notable achievements, <clears throat> the first seemed to be the banning of, um, of using uh, birch in flogging in the Royal Navy. That was banned. Um, the Court of Appeal was established with the help of the Humanitarian League. So that was quite um, an, an achievement, really. Uh, general prison reforms in the 1898 Prisons Act uh, was part and parcel of their achievements. 1908, the provision of British national parks in Snowdonia, where I used to live, the Lake District and the Scottish Highlands and the Peak District around the uh, Midlands, kind of well, North Midlands area, I suppose. Um, this was to preserve in the wilderness uh, the cherished property of the people, uh, they called it. Um, so again, that's quite an interesting kind of history um, of achievements. Um, I suppose um, in terms of other animals, the provision of the national parks was incredibly important and possibly in terms of culture too, maybe changing people's attitude towards other animals, their protection, their habitats, those, those kind of ideas. Sol also sought to protect mountains. He was interested in protecting plains and heathlands, uh, woods and marshes, and also the seashore. And he said that he wants to protect all those, and this is a very modern sounding claim. He said, they, these need protection from the greed of developers and the destruction of machines. He said he also opposed the picking of wild flowers and the pouring of chemical wastes into streams and rivers. So you can imagine what he would be thinking in modern day terms about the intensive farms and their um, leakage into uh, waterways. OK, so in 70 years amongst um, savages, Salt declared that humanitarianism is not merely an expression of sympathy with pain, but it is a protest against all tyr tyranny and desecration, including the vandalism, which can ruthlessly destroy the natural grace of the earth. Again, if you 
saw that debate in 1989 um, that I, I mentioned, the uh, British um, Institute one, you'll see that um, Richard Ryder in his kind of uh, speech, opening speech, he, he talked about the vandalism of blood sports. And it's pretty clear that you probably got that, I would think, from from salt, the, the, that kind of, um, you know, phraseology. Finally, he linked the op op opposition to war and colonialism with his conservation uh, concerns, which, again, is a pretty... Um, the RSPB's founders were female, Emily uh, Williamson and Lisa Phillips, before women even had a vote. Yeah, that's that's an interesting point. Uh, thanks for that, uh, that observation. Okay, uh, in uh, Saviour of Salt, this is an anthology uh, of uh, Salt. It's published in 1989. Uh, Salt uh, is saying, um, while we are willing to spend vast uh, sums on grabbing other people's territories, we have not, of course, a penny to spare for the preservation of our own, uh, which is pretty good. And he responded to pushback against his arguments. And again, in, in, that, um, in that other resource, you can see um, quite a lot of reviews of his work. But he responded to the pushback to that kind of thing with um, wit and some scorn probably aided and abetted by George Bernard Shaw for example it wasn't long before people started to ask what would become of other animals if he achieved his aim of widespread um, vegetarianism and this is where he responded with one of his most uh, mocking uh, statements he said that um he had this vision of the grievous wanderings of homeless herds of cows, this is, who can find no kind protector to eat them. And that was in the humanities of uh, diet. On the question of what we should do without leather, uh, Salt responded in a similar way. He, he said that this presents a lurid picture of a world left shoeless by an instantaneous con uh, conversion to vegetarianism. So again, uh, the, the, ca the kind of comments that modern day vegans get, they, they got back then uh, as well. Now we know that the vegan social movement came into being in the last years of World War II in 1944. The Humanitarian League's demise, according to Mark Gold, came about with the advent of the Great War. In fact, the league closed its doors one year into World War I, uh, in other words, 1919. And Henry Salt wrote to a friend not long before he died, aged 88, suggesting that the Humanitarian League had failed, and it had probably failed because he thought it might have been 100 to two years too early in terms of... Um, uh, I don't know, human evolution, should we call it? He said that the Humanitarian League, Salt said this, was way ahead of any religion of its day, and also its vision was also clearer than any scientist um, of the day. And, um, you know, his legacy, um, as I've suggested, was pretty impressive. We've seen that Gandhi went vegetarian due to Salt's influences but there was many others too ramsey mcdonald for example he went on to become the first uh, labor prime minister um, in britain gk chesterton the writer and philosopher etc george meredith um, novelist and victorian uh, poet sydney and beatrice webb they were socialist economists reformers early members of the fabian society linked with uh, left-wing politics, Labour Party, etc., and uh, George Bernard Shaw, uh, playwright. Uh, they all name-checked um, Salt as uh, major influences. Uh, as well as mild-mannered, as we said at the beginning, Shaw described Salt as original and unique. And then finally, if we think of the organisations that were probably... Um, was inspired or uh, was part and parcel of the, the formation was because of the Humanitarian League. Uh, 
then the RSPCA would be one candidate. Friends of the Earth, certainly the Vegetarian Society, Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, the Howard League for Penal Reform, Amnesty International, and the Council for the Protection of Rural England. So as you can see from that, a, a remarkable um, roster of interest uh, which marked out uh, what was the Humanitarian League. Right, um, Andy in the background, have we got any comments that I've missed? And if so, uh, you're welcome to put them back up um, because I'm, I may have done, I, I often do. Uh, the Plumish League, oh, okay. And uh, was the head of the Fur and Leather League in Croydon. In 1891, they joined forces and 15 years later, they got a royal charter. Yeah, well, that's obviously one part of the story that I need to look into because that's quite fascinating in its, um, itself. And in fact, it sounds like Williamson and Phillips might um, might be candidates for a, a time tunnel all of their own with the sound of it. I'm always keen on um, highlighting and underlining the importance of the uh, women members of uh, our history, if you like, because... They, they often are the, the ones that uh, tend to get uh, neglected, um, as said. So let me just have a quick look at some of the comments. Is there anything else, Andy, or are we done? Mm. Must be extremely hard to be vegan, vegetarian, or even plant-based back in those days. Yeah, well, again, you know, you got that argument about, you know, the basis of veganism, um, in terms of the diet, um, uh, plant-based eating it is always fruit and veg. So they, they were always there and um, they would have been seasonal at the time. They would have probably been a lot more healthy than what you get in the modern day supermarkets. But, you know, that could be argued, I suppose. Um, what did Deb say? Um, especially when the experts are saying it was dangerous to your health. Yes, indeed. Well, we know the story that the modern... Uh, the first people who um, became involved with the vegan social movement were told that they were risking uh, their lives. And um, they, my my big joke is that they risked it for a vegan biscuit, which I always say. Right, people, thank you very much then for tuning in to yet another vegan time tunnel. There will be one again next week as we build our archive. So thanks very much for joining us and we'll see you again. Thanks a lot.